Right. Well, welcome everybody. Yeah, <laughs> welcome. I'm glad that you made it through the snow and the wind and the rain. They don't know that who's listening to this. I mean, it could be years down the line. So it's really rainy and snow. No, it's not. But anyway, guys, the the message that I really feel like God's put on my heart to share with you tonight is too hot for this even, isn't it? <laughs> I thought, you know, I went out and bought like a proper preacher's jacket and stuff, and I thought, man, but no. But the message that I really feel God's laid in my heart for, for tonight, and he's been putting it on my heart a lot recently, yeah, is, and I've titled it, What's Love Got To Do With It? Okay, and I had a really like little witty intro, yeah, of like Tina Turner's song, right, and I thought that would be like really clever, you know, funny, because... I like that kind of thing. So I'll just tell you about the, the presentation all right, as we go along. Build a picture in your mind all right, of these things. Just imagine Tina, she's like straight in her stuff. She's like, what's love? Go. I can't sing, so I won't do it. All right, but that, that, that was the, the start of it, okay? And uh, then I go on to this. I say, so how many of you enjoy going out and having a Starbucks once a week or getting a takeout once a week, or you know, just do something nice, like just kind of, like almost reward yourself, yeah, just just fairly regularly, how many of you actually do that, yeah, yeah, yeah most of you do, some of you do that, I was expecting like 30 people and I thought, you know, maybe <laughs> 10 or 15 people would say, yeah, that's me, but you know, but yeah, we do, so that's out there, the thing that God's been really speaking to me about this week, past couple of weeks, is the issue of love. All right. Last Sunday really got me. God's been speaking to me about it for a little bit, but last Sunday really got me. I was sat at the back and I was like getting myself all kind of, you know, almost teary. Well, I was a bit teary. And I shared with a couple of people this week, and particularly with the youth this week, that I've got this kind of agonising inside of me that, that I really, really want to have like a proper, like a proper snot and tears kind of ball it session. Yeah, but I can't. I just, I can't kind of release it for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah, I haven't had a proper kind of session like that for about 10 years since my me, me best mate died. And, you know, I, I, I like, you know, get a bit teary if something happy comes on, you know, on the TV. Or even something really stupid. Like, uh, Microsoft had a, like a, an email advert, right, a couple of years ago. And this is just when Isaac was being born, okay? And the, the advert was like, this dad is like taking photos and videos of like his, his daughter all the way through the years. And then when she was 18, he's kind of given her the, the password for the account. So she's got like a record of her life, yeah, like through email, through the medium of email. And I thought, oh man, I start, I start crying at that, you know. And I, uh. But I really feel like I need to have a proper, like, proper, you know what I mean, yeah, the snot kind of cry rise at kind of yeah. moment. But I can't have that. And I think what God's really trying to say to me, yeah, is, is I need to love more. I feel like I need to love more. And I know, like, you, you can think, well, how do you do that? What do you mean? And I, I, I don't know what I mean. That's kind of the point of this message, yeah? I'm hoping that part of this message is an act of love from you guys in just allowing me to, to deliver this message because I think God will probably do more in me through this than he will you. <laughs> but I'm hoping, still, that God will still speak to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah? Um, so I've had that going on like all this week and then another story kind of linked to that is I don't know how many of you know but my wife and I we've come to this arrangement where I've gone back to being a 14 year old boy and I get £10 a week pocket money okay this is kind of an act of my love to her in, in the sense that um you know, I'm, I'm the main earner in the household, all right, so I pay most of the bills and all that kind of thing, all right. But because of that, I've almost had the attitude through the years of, well, because of it, and because I do overtime, then I can reward myself, yeah, those little bits extra. Do you know what I mean? I can have those extra cakes, I can have those extra Starbucks 
and I don't really drink Starbucks, but I can have those Starbucks Cafe Nero, man. And, you know, <laughs> or, or, you know, I can treat myself, or treat us even, like, as a family. Like, I'll go out and, and buy, like, all the fajita mix, you know, stuff, which is, like, a nice little treat for us, right? So I've had that kind of attitude. I'm like, that's not really a, the best attitude. That's not the godly attitude to have. Because we haven't got a lot of money, all right? We, we, are, we do kind of... We don't struggle to make ends meet, but we do have to be careful with what we do do with our money. We have to budget carefully. So I've had this bad attitude all, all this time. And God spoke to me about that, about loving my family more than myself. And being able to do that for them, yeah? So that in the long run, we will be better off for it. Because my wife is so much wiser and so much better with, with money and figures and accountancy and household management and all that kind of thing than what I am, yeah? I've never been in, like, massive debt, don't get me wrong, but she's so much better than me is an act of love for me for her to do that. So has anyone got a fiver I can have? Is anyone, like, willing to go without their Starbucks or their, like, takeaway for, for me? Because I only have, like, a tenner a week. Do you know what I mean? And like, half of that goes on a Friday night. I'm <laughs> telling you, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. Be serious. Anyone want to give me a fiver? I'll give you a fiver. I owe you a fiver anyway. Well, you owe me that fiver. That <laughs> ain't really giving me a fiver, is it? I'll give you a tenner then. All right, cool. Sweet. We've got that one. We've got witnesses. All right. <laughs> so, so, that is an example, yeah, of John 15, verse 12. If you've got your Bibles, you can flick through these things. I'm going to like camp out in a particular passage in a minute, but if you want to go along with me. John 15, 12. Yeah, as soon as I say it, most of you will know this verse as well. All right. But what John is saying, or what God is saying through John at this point, is he's saying, love each other as I have loved you. That's quite a tall order. That's quite a big deal. I mean, Jesus is saying this, actually. John's just recording the words. And he's saying, love each other as I have loved you. At this point, he hasn't gone to the cross yet. But he's still loved them in a way that is far superior to the way that most of us love each other. I think on the whole, churches probably love each other quite well, actually. You know, I have my issues with it. And a lot of people do have their issues with it. I wonder why so many people might leave the church and go away and complain about it. I think that some people do go away because they felt unloved. Maybe they've not been unloved, but they felt unloved. They haven't received the demonstration of love that they expect from people that they should have a higher standard of love to what everybody is used to. Because that's what we're called to be as Christians, right? We're called to live to a higher standard. We talked about this, or I talked about this a few weeks ago to the way that the world lives. And when people come into the church, they expect us to live to that higher standard. And when we don't meet their expectations, they feel unloved. Even though, actually, they they probably have been loved quite a lot. So, uh, Luke 10, 27, goes on to say, Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And love your neighbour as yourself. Jesus is saying here, yeah, that we need to love God first and foremost, and out of that we need to love our neighbour. And in this passage of scripture, some smarty pants goes, so who's my neighbour then? Well, Jesus goes on to say that your neighbour isn't the person in church. Right? We need to love people in church. And yes, we need to love our brethren more so And I think more so because we spend more time with them. We have more of a relationship with them. We have more of a bond with people. So therefore we should know each other's needs greater and better than those outside in the world. Does this make sense so far? Yeah? Am I all making it crystal? Yeah? So God says, yeah, love your neighbour as yourself. How good are we at this? Just ask yourself that question right now. Just say, how good am I at loving my neighbour, actually? Do I love my neighbour 
actually. I know for one myself that I'm not very good at it. I was once. I had a season in my life where I was pretty good at at loving my neighbour. I probably wasn't even a Christian at the time, right? But then I became a Christian and you get like sucked into church life and the way things are done around church and you kind of forget your former life, which isn't a bad thing, all right? And you get kind of into church and the way church operates, which is a good thing, don't get me wrong, that's where we should be. But we shouldn't be there to the neglect and detriment of loving our neighbour. Loving those that once we like were chums with. And maybe we're not anymore because our lives have moved on and we've not got the same kind of, you know, rapport, what we used to have with them. We haven't got the same interests and things in common. So you have less and less to talk about. So, of course, you're not going to like hang around them as much and you can't love them so much because you're not on the same wavelength. But God calls us to love these people. Jesus says, this is the second greatest commandment, even. That's pretty weighty. So, okay, let's, uh, let's, let's, can we have the, can I, sorry mate, can I just ask you to put on, I think it's slide, uh, might be slide four or slide five. I think in the Google Drive tab at the bottom. This, yeah? I don't know, I can't see. This is slide four. Where's the thing on? Uh, oh. You need to just drag it across. Sorry, everyone listening in. <laughs> uh, down. That one. That's, that's the one I want. Go on, you can leave that there. We'll, we'll keep that there. <laughs> all right, it's all right. We've all got our specs on, haven't we? Yeah, we're okay. So... In, in that passage, yeah, you know, the, the Samaritan was the person that was the, the, the kind one, the loving one. But who is it that you don't really like in your life? I'm going to come back to this in a minute. The reason why I say that is how it stands with the story. But uh, is there anyone in your life that you, you really don't like? You really don't love because of issues of unforgiveness and you know hurt in the past and things like that. And they're all valid reasons. I wouldn't ever discount them and discredit them and say that they're not real because they are. But you've got that name in your head, right? But we're created in the image and likeness of God, yeah? Genesis one twenty seven tells us that. It says that we are created in the image and likeness of God. Male and female he created them. And we're to be reflectors of God's love also, aren't we? As we just saw in John fifteen twelve, love each other as I have loved you. So if we're loving each other as Jesus loved us, surely that's a reflection of how Jesus wants us to kind of be. We're to reflect his love to the world. Yeah? So, I know this might sound a bit harsh, but do we think that sometimes we just need to get over ourselves a little bit? Yeah? We've got a bit too much self-importance of like, I'm a Christian now, I'm doing the right thing, I'm doing good, maybe, maybe not, okay? But I think sometimes we do. And I need to myself, so, you know, don't forget what I said earlier, I think, you know, God, God is using this to affect my life as much as anybody else's, so please don't think I'm having a go. But I hope that we want to be able to live in the way of being a reflector of God's glory and love. Yeah? I hope that is the desire of our heart, to be able to live to that higher standard and to love people as Jesus loved people. To be able to do the things that Jesus did and able to demonstrate that kind of love. It's a... It's a thing that we need to learn to do, though. I don't think it's something that actually comes naturally to us. Even though we're created in God's image and likeness, I think sin has kind of seared it so much through the generations that now we don't really know how to love properly. We know in the world that when you say, do you love someone, we know that what they mean 
is do you have fluffy hearts and bunny rabbits for someone? Yeah? Do you have like a dozen red roses and petals on the stairs for someone? But we know biblically that's not really the way to do it. So let's just, we, know, we all know this story, don't we? Yeah, the story of the Good Samaritan. Yeah? So we just saw that Jesus has said, you know, the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God and love your neighbour as yourself. And then the smart Alex says, so who is my neighbour? And Jesus goes on to say, well, this is, your, this is the story of who your neighbour is, right? This is who your neighbour is. I've just got a few practical things that we can draw out of this story, right? I'm sorry it's not very funny. All the funny stuff was on the slides. But there's a few practical things that we can draw out of this, all right, to help us learn how to love better. Do we all want to learn how to love better? I think quite often you'll, we will look at these things and you'll hear me say these things and we'll go, yeah, yeah, I knew that. Or, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Or, yeah, yeah, that one I could be better at. But we need to do them, like, holistically, yeah, like, all together. Can't just choose one and leave the others. This is the way this is going to work. So, let's dive into this, yeah? Loving someone is more than just noticing a need. Right? It's more than just noticing a need. Yeah? A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. There's a need, for one thing. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. That is another need. Yeah? There are two things there that probably people could have witnessed. They might, they might not. The Bible doesn't tell us whether they witnessed them or not. If they did witness them, no one did anything about it. And if they didn't witness them, poor bloke, really. And we don't know who the bloke is either. We don't know if he's like a Jew, or we don't know if he's a Samaritan, we don't know if he's like a thief himself. We've got no idea. But I think for the purposes of Jesus' parable, he's trying to say that he's actually a, a Jewish guy. That he's one that keeps to the law. That's just... My speculation. We shouldn't speculate on the Bible. It tells us that. But you know. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. He noticed a need. Didn't do anything about it. So too, a Levite, like a priest, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Could you imagine Pastor Tony walking past a tramp or a beggar in the street that was like crying out for help? That's what happened. They noticed the need. okay, But they sought their own comfort. They were unwilling to be put out, even they, though they knew the right to do, the good thing to do, they knew it, yet they still decided, and it was a choice, to go for their own comfort, rather than the comfort of the man in need. In today's world, we could probably see this quite a lot. We, in our heads, we could probably think of London. Because you can walk down almost any street and pass any tube station and there is some guy there with a, with a dog that's like half dead and you know, with a, a hat in front of him yeah, playing a guitar with like two strings left. You know? And we go, we justify it to ourselves sometimes. We say, well, well, he chose to be in that position. There's help out there if he needs it. Uh, you know, he, he probably ran away from home. Or he's just a dirty, smelly thief. All he's going to do is spend it on, like, alcohol or drugs or something like that. We justify these things to ourselves. We see the need, but we choose our own comfort above helping this person. Yeah? We could help these people in many ways, as we're going to look at. All right. But it's more than just noticing the need. Love requires action. All right? Love is a verb. Yeah? It's a to do thing. It's not a noun. It's a verb. So as Christians, we need to make love happen. 
right? We need to make love happen. It's not something passive or something that we can pretend. It is something that we actively do. And we know we've, we've like been there. This, I, this is just a, a little example of what came across me like in the last couple of weeks. But someone was talking to me. And I was chatting away, chat, 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 chat. And you know like when someone is just chatting to you, yeah? Maybe it's your wife or your husband or like, you know, someone at, at college or school or at work or something. And they're just chat, 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 chat. And they've got all these issues they want to talk to you about. And you just zone out. And like you see the lips moving and you're just like, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, uh-huh. And then you realise you went one aha uh-huh, too many. And like, you've, you've got to come back and be like, oh no, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, Great Auntie Mabel. Yeah, good old girl. But we've all been there. That is not very loving. Nor is helping someone, like helping them, yeah, and then complaining about it afterwards. You need your garden doing. I'll be round tomorrow with my hater lawnmower. Right, so you lug it over there and you start pushing your lawnmower up and down, you're doing your bit, and the next day you're like, their garden is such a dirty tip, man. I can't believe they let it get to that state. It's unbelievable. But that ain't love neither. Right? <laughs> Nor is forgiving someone and saying, you know, it's alright, I'll forgive you. I know you didn't mean to do that to me. Praise the Lord that He forgives us. And I'll forgive you because he forgave us. And then later on that day, you go in, they hurt me so bad. They hurt me. It cut me right to the core. And I've forgiven them. But I still don't want to see them. I still don't want to look at their face. Well, they ain't very loving neither. You might not want to see their face, but don't go telling everyone about it. Right? It takes... One person to forgive, two to reconcile. Wise man told me that once. So as the first point, yeah, that love requires action. We see that the good Samaritan takes action. He comes across the bloody, dirty, you know, half-dead guy in the street, yeah, probably somewhere in Harlow, and helps him out. Point number two. Love might get you dirty. Yeah? Loving someone might get you dirty. Yeah? Ruth's got this awesome story. I love this story. This is hilarious. When I first heard it, I'll wet myself. Like, almost. Not quite. <laughs> yeah? Maybe if I laughed a bit harder, it, it, it would have done. But anyway, she, was out, she used to be a school teacher, yeah, as many of you know. She was out on this school trip, yeah, doing this autumnal school trip with all the kids. And they're walking through like this kind of Shady, leafy glen in the middle of where, right? It's really pretty. Just imagine it. All the leaves are turning golden brown. The light is like coming through and it's dappled on the floor. Yeah. And, and she didn't know, but it was a regular dog walking spot. Okay. She's got all the kids with her. Yeah. And as they're walking along, a load of dogs just come out of nowhere. They're all with like their owners and stuff, but there was like a good few of them all come out of like the bushes and stuff. And one of the little girls that she's in charge of and she's in care of is terrified, absolutely terrified, right? So this little girl comes running up to Ruth and starts climbing her, yeah? And Ruth's got like a nice new jumper on and stuff. And you know like what you girls are like. You're wearing something nice and new and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. hope someone notices this because, you know, it's, it costs a lot of money and, you know, I look good in it. And whatever, yeah? So this little girl climbs up Ruth and she gets to the point where she's crouching on Ruth's chest. Ruth could have just been like, ah! And like dropped her to the floor. But she didn't. She had compassion on this little girl because she was so terrified. Now remember, I said it was a regular dog walking spot. And it wasn't just mud on the bottom of this little girl's shoe. That is the story. Okay? Nice. Hilarious. Yeah. I couldn't hug her when she came home that day. So... Uh, yeah, but that is love, yeah, getting someone dirty, right? For you, it could be, yeah, a bit more metaphorical than that. It could be putting your reputation on the line. It could be helping someone that has got a bad reputation, right, 
and you being seen with this person or associated with this person, even though you're helping them, yeah, and loving them through a situation or a time, yeah, it might it might mean that your reputation gets tarnished. So I might say, but aren't you supposed to be a Christian? What are you doing around these people? You say, I'm just living like Jesus, bluff. Jesus was, was around sinners and tax collectors. Yeah? Just, just living the life. But you might get a, a tarnished reputation because of this, because of loving someone. Or it might be like an actual physical kind of getting dirt, like, you know, going around someone's garden and doing their gardening for them or, you know, changing an oil filter or, you know, just going around someone's and doing a bit of housework. Yeah? We've all seen hoarders, right? Yeah? Some of, those, some of those people are nuts, man. Absolutely crazy. I mean, but, you know, it's an act of love to go around there to help these people and to clean up their homes to a place where they feel quite happy to have people around. Yeah? Number three, love will cost you time. Won't it? It'll cost you time. We've all got busy lives. I know. Oh, sorry, I didn't even refer to the point of number two. The point of number two of why it's in this story, I'm a bad preacher and I really, I shouldn't be doing this gig. But he went to the man and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Now this guy is covered in blood and stuff. Imagine how dirty he would have got helping this guy out. That was all. I could have skipped that. But I thought it was important. Yeah, I needed to say that. It will cost you time. This guy, yeah, the good Samaritan guy, he took time out of his day to love this stranger. He didn't have to. He could have just carried on walking like the priest and the Levite, yeah? He could have just thrown him a couple of coins and said, you know, get a taxi. But he didn't. He took time out of his day. He was probably a busy bloke as well. He was obviously on his way to somewhere, Right? probably somewhere quite important because he's going through this bandit country yeah, which was notorious at the time for being bandit country so he's probably like oh I've got to take a shortcut through this place to get home quick or get to my destination quick instead of going the long route round so he probably had something quite important to do yeah? there was a, a, a study done by a, a Christian university in America and they had these two um, test cases of students and one test case of students they said um, you need to get to this lecture on time. It's like a really, really important lecture. If you miss it, you'll get like docked points off your um, like final exams and stuff. So they told this one set of students that, and they set the other set of students saying, it's not, you know, it, it is important, okay, you still need to get there and stuff, but there's going to be something happen en route. So it's kind of pre warned about it. Now, en route, there was a guy who was like the, the, the beaten up half dead guy, like in the middle of the, the campus. Now remember, these, this is a, a Christian college. So all the guys here are Christian, so they all have kind of roughly the same values and morals and stuff. And what happened was the ones that were told that it was absolutely essential that they get to the place where they lose points, walked straight past. And they just left the guy there. The ones that were kind of pre-warned that something might happen, about 90% of the people actually stopped and helped, even though they knew that it was an important exam and they might be dot points. But because they had the mindset of something might happen en route, yeah, keep my eyes open for danger, yeah, they were more willing to help and sacrifice their time and, and as far as they knew, their, their scores, to do something about it. That's quite profound, I think. I think we can quite often get in that kind of mode of being like, I'm busy, I've got a lot to do, you know, I've, I've got a young family, I've got an active family, I, I work hard all week, you know, I just I do enough already. That, you know, they're all good reasons, yeah? I mean, if you are genuinely busy, that's fine. Most of us are actually genuinely busy. But if we wake up in the mornings with the mindset of, might someone need my help today, I'll be there for them, then I think we're more likely to be there to help that person and sacrifice a bit of our time, because ultimately, what are we going to do with our time? We're going to go home and watch The X Factor. 
maybe. We can skip that a week, you know, or watch it on demand or whatever, yeah? I love the way Pastor Tony actually embodies this, yeah? That dude is one busy dude. There is no denying it, yeah? He's an accountant. He's, he's building a business again from scratch, yeah? So he's doing that. He's a landlord, so he has to deal with the houses that he, he has, yeah? He's a pastor, so he deals with, like, us lot, yeah? He's a, he's a dad, a husband, yeah? Busy, busy dude. And there's other stuff that he does as well. He's an entrepreneur. He's involved in, like, other business ventures and stuff. Mate, and if any one of us says, pastor, I need your time, I need your help, I need whatever, does he or does he not, yeah, most of the time, actually help us, yeah? He takes the time out of his day to listen to us over the phone, or to come to our house, or to meet us somewhere, or whatever, yeah? Man, it is an example, right? It really is. No matter how busy you are and how stressed out you get, you'll always find the time to do the things that you're passionate about. So let's hope that we're passionate about people and loving them, yeah? Number four, loving people will cost you money. It will cost you money to love people. This dude spent quite a lot of money, yeah, on the half-dead guy. Not only did he take him to the inn, give the innkeeper a bit of cash, he cost him, like, his own oil, which was a bit of a commodity, his own wine, which is a bit of a commodity, yeah. He had bandages on him. I, I don't know, maybe he was like a first aid or something, right? But it cost him all of his personal stuff, yeah. It cost him some money. And then he goes to the innkeeper and he gets there and he says, I'll be back in a few days. If it costs you any more, I'll pay it. I'll do it. It will cost you money to love people. But do we have that money available to spare when it comes to that place. You just heard my story, yeah? All right? But the reason we're doing what we're doing is for this. So that in the future, I mean, yeah, all right, if someone desperately needs help now, yeah, then we'll do what we can to help people out. But I want to be in a place in my life in the future where I'm financially secure enough to be able to Someone needs it to loan them or give them a substantial amount of money to get through a difficult time or place in their life. Yeah? Quite a lot of time, we don't really live like that. We don't. That's another message for another day. Okay? But it will cost us money. It might just be a couple of quid. It could be, I don't know, if we can afford it, several thousand pounds. Yeah? To be able to love people and to help them out. Yes, so. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks for that tenor. Um, it requires forgiveness. <laughs> Alright? It does require forgiveness to love people well. And that's why I asked right back at the very beginning, and I said we'd get back to it. But... We look at this story and we just read it. We don't really read it in its context. Yeah, it's a parable, it's a made-up story. But this kind of thing did actually happen. And they did live in these times. And the reason Jesus uses a Samaritan is because they were the hated people. The Jewish people did not like the Samaritans because they were the split from the original kingdom of David. Yeah, after the time of Solomon, the kingdom split. So they had two separate kingdoms. And over time, the, the northern kingdom, Samaria, became more and more stiff necks against God. And they became less and less uh, God-fearing. So as a result of that, yeah, the Jewish people didn't like them at all. Now, it probably worked the other way around as well. I imagine that you know, if you're not liked very much, you don't like that other person particularly either. I know I'm like that. If someone don't like me, I ain't very keen on them. At the end of the day, that's just the way it, it rolls, isn't it? It shouldn't be like that. But this is how it is in this day. This Samaritan guy probably didn't like Jewish people particularly. He probably had unforgiveness issues in his heart. Do you know what I mean? Maybe some Jewish guy had like 
mugged him off at some point in his past. Maybe, yeah, he'd been beaten up by a Jewish bandit or robber. So he had a lot to, like, spank him back for. But he didn't. He got over himself and his beliefs and his ideologies and his philosophies to love someone. In today's world, what does that look like? Yeah? I mean, quite, some of us probably remember that after the Second World War, or our grandparents will definitely remember this, that the British didn't like the Germans very much. Yeah? It wasn't a personal thing. It was just a, a cultural national thing. It was a feeling of national pride. You don't like that nation. Today, it probably stands, I don't know, against the Muslims. Yeah? That, you know, we might be more likely to, to judge and be unloving to a Muslim guy than we would, like, a, a nice English person, for example, who isn't even Christian but holds on to, like, the, the Union Jack flag, for example. We'd be more likely to help them than the Muslim guy or the Polish guy or, you know, whoever, because racism is still rife in this country. It actually is. It's just changed its form a little bit and it goes under a different kind of name but it's the same as it ever was. Just the same as it ever was. And we all know it. We've all seen it. Maybe we've all been a part of it. I was. Maybe it is just someone's philosophy. Maybe we don't like people just because they are atheists. So they say something stupid, right? Like, oh, this world should be very much better if everybody was happy. Just do what you want and be happy. And you're like, well, that's stupid. I, I think that's stupid. I don't like those kinds of people. I think you're an idiot, right? If I came and punched you in the face, I'm living according to your philosophy, and that's all right with you. There's nothing you can do about that. You're stupid. But so many people hold on to that, right? I've got unforgiveness issues in my heart. Don't judge me, okay? But this is the way it is. We are quick to not love those that are very different to ourselves. It requires forgiveness. So I was going to recap these, all right? To love well is more than just noticing the need. We need to make love happen. It might get you dirty. It will cost you time. It will cost you money. And it requires forgiveness. So what's love got to do with it? What's love got to do with it? We could just do all of these things, couldn't we? To live happy and morally and ethically. We don't have to be Christians to, you know, help someone in need. There are plenty of charity agencies out there that do that brilliantly. Probably better than most Christian agencies. You don't have to be a Christian to, like, put your reputation on the line, to get dirty, to, like, muck in with a, with a project. Plenty of people do that. All over the place. You don't have to be a Christian to cost your or to, to give up, sacrifice your time for the sake of others. You don't have to be a Christian to, you know, sacrifice your money for the sake of others. You don't. You don't even have to be a Christian to forgive somebody else. You will still benefit from it if you do these things. So what's love got to do with it? 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. 1 to 4. And I'll read it. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain 
nothing. Yes. We need to make love happen. We need to make love a verb and act upon it. But beyond that, we need to have love in our hearts for mankind. Not just our own kind, but for mankind. We need to have our hearts broken for the things that break God's. We need to get up every morning to be aware that there might be a need in our path on that day. We need to be willing to sacrifice of ourselves, to get over ourselves, and to make the tough calls in life that actually achieve so much and reveal God's glory, reflect Jesus' love, and help us to live to that higher standard that we're called to as Christians. I've just got a quick, powerful testimony that I'd like to show. It's just a couple of minutes long. Would you mind sticking on the last YouTube video, please, mate? Perfect.